This episode of UDSP is brought to you by Audible. For a free 30-day trial, go on over to audible.com forward slash gamebreaker. You're going to get 30 days, and you're going to get a free book. Pretty sweet. Gamebreaker TV. Internet and welcome to UDSP Unicorn Duck Shadow Puppet. This is episode 38 for March 14th or March 12th. March 12th. See, I'm all confused already. We haven't even started yet. March 12th, 2014. And on today's show, there hasn't been a lot of news lately, and now we know why. And then there's some raid stuff, and then there's some war plot stuff, and then there's some NDA dropping stuff. Uh, oh, by the way, there's a release date, too. But joining me, as always, you know him, you love him, Mr. Farhan Sadiqi. How are you? Good, good. Yes, this is an excellent day. You know, we actually get to report on the day that it happens, which is also amazing. And there's just so much to talk about. Oh, my God, it's just streaming out of my mind. Just uh, everything. It's going to be it's gonna be a blast. And I know there's about a dozen things that you want to talk about that you haven't been able to talk about. And you've been very careful on the show to... Can I talk about that? Can I not? I can't remember. So let's start getting into it. Now, for those of you watching this show, obviously you're Wildstar fans. Before we even start, yes, the pre-orders are coming soon. Yes, the release date was announced. We're going to break it all down for you. But right off the bat... GameStop already has their pre-order up. If you want to go pre-order Wildstar, check out GameBreaker's homepage. That's GameBreaker.tv. We've got the Wildstar offer right there for you for the standard copy at $59.99. No word yet on the $79.99 uh, Deluxe Edition. We'll keep you posted on that. But we put a link right in the article. Check it out. Give it a click. If you're going to pre-order the game, do it, do it, do it now. Check out that link right on GameBreaker.tv. TV. So, it's been a little slow. It would help if I brought your camera back up. It's been a little <laughs> slow this week, and now we kind of know why. Huge info drop this week. Now, all weekend, Carbine's pretty much been tweeting out photo after photo after photo of their press event this past weekend. So, we all knew something was coming. Some yeah, of no, us uh, kind of uh, thought that this might be it. And it's it like all like, oh my god, the news is so huge, I can't wait to tell right, you. Right, right, it it we can't wait. So the NDA is gone completely. Yes. Gone. Pre-orders have been announced, and the release date is officially revealed. June 3rd, very early in the summer. Happy with the date? Yes, yes. You know, like, like I'm a little bit sad that Mark couldn't make it, apparently, because I wanted to just gloat and be like, oh, wait, who is the one who is saying that it that it would be coming a little bit sooner rather than later? Like, at the end of spring, like, just sort of like what they were saying, maybe towards the last, last week of what you would consider spring. Right. You know, that Tuesday. Like, I, I think that was familiar. Maybe this, I should go this back. This all sounds very familiar. And, and Mark, unfortunately, c couldn't join us today. Uh, don't know what was going on. Hope everything's okay. And, and we, will, we will see you next week, our friend. We certainly miss you. So catch you, catch you next week. Uh, the date kind of makes sense to me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. June 3rd just feels right. And we all, a lot of us kind of speculated it was going to be mid this year when last year it got pushed from 2013 to 2014. We were kind of, okay, then we'll see that about in the spring and the summertime. And then given some other release dates, some that we've <laughs> yeah. known for a little while now and some that we've just got a little bit of information for about this week, really kind of solidified this has got to be a June-July re release for me. So this totally makes sense. Elder Scrolls launching on April 4th. So that means Wildstar's coming out right at the end of the first paid month for those people, right? Because that's a two-month gap. They get 30 days free. They'll have paid yeah. for one month. And then, boom, Wildstar comes out. Do you, is that a factor? Like, not only, okay, we want to get away from another MMO's release a little bit, but do you think they took into account... People will have played this for a month. Then they will. The ones that really like it will have paid for a month at this point. Now it's a it's a it's a good time to launch. I, I think so. I think it's like a number of things between trying to 
give themselves enough time, you know, from now to just finish doing some of the testing, finish getting everything ready and, and, and packed in. And, you know, it just works out so well that if they give themselves these, you know, a couple more months to go, that it just gives them that little, nice little gap so that people who have bought Elder Scrolls, like, you know, now at this point, I have no pressure against me not to buy Elder Scrolls, because I knew I was going to buy Wildstar, Wildstar, obviously. So I could just buy Elder Scrolls, and I, and I know that I'm probably going to be done with it. By the time Wildstar comes out, so we're well, not gonna there's have that pressure. there's a there's a ringing endorsement for Elder Scrolls, right? It's Farhan Siddiqui. I know by that time I'll be done with it. 2014. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a ringing endorsement. That's just me personally. But yeah. <laughs> now here's the thing, though. You know, you know, absolutely yeah. know that Blizzard's gonna come in and ruin this day with something, right? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> they, they, it's just their mo. They, it's they have to. So they announced an incredibly vague release window for Warlords of Draenor. It was like the expansion will be out or before December twentieth. Well, thank you so much for that date because you told us it was this year anyway. So you've lopped off <laughs> eleven possible days. That, It'll that be it, here in time for Christmas, basically. Right? That's what they said. But yeah, wouldn't it? it would be, I, I mean, like I would. It, could you see uh, uh, Blizzard just kind of putting that date out there just to give Wildstar that date and give Carbine that date and then Carbine makes this decision? Or do you think this was oh. this was well, in I the mean, works? Like, the press event was last weekend. Yeah. So, you know? so, so it was already that much locked. Was that, you know, yeah. obviously well ahead of time. I think that Blizzard's move was interesting because it was sort of like, okay, well, here's the Monday. Let's just get the, the, the pre-orders going for us going in there. You know, right before Wildstar is going to be announcing their stuff, and then so it's sort of like they get to have their cake and eat it too. They get to preempt Wildstar and then still put their release date whenever the hell they wanted to. <laughs> it's just uh, you, you know, Storm Heroes of the Storm is it, it's going to have that some too. big event yeah. at the beginning of June. Now it's just it's guaranteed. It's open beta June third. Congratulations! And her storm got released yesterday. <laughs> yeah, so. like very unofficially official too, right? It was like a, a tweet. <laughs> Hey, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's released. So I don't know. Blizzard's got gonna get in on this in, in some way, and, and Heroes of the Storm probably makes the most sense. I don't think Warlords is coming anytime in in June. Uh, so there was some confusion though, and, and it wasn't just in in I, Justin Kennedy did a write up on Wildstar TV on a lot of what we're covering today. So. If you are a Wildstar fanatic, Justin does great write-ups. Go to the site and check it all out. He got to experience the event, and he's got all of the info and his thoughts there. So definitely check it all out since we can't cover every single piece of it in one show. Uh, but there was a little bit of confusion with collector's editions, physical copies, North America, EU, and, and what would be available where. Initially, initial reports said... No NA physical edition, none, and all of us kind of really went, surprising. It's yeah, what? right. All of us kind of just went, huh? Right. I'm a box baby, man. I, I, you put it in a box and put a game name on it. I'm gonna buy it. Uh, so that that was really disappointing. And then people were like, well, okay, can I buy an EU copy of the game and transfer my? Uh, got really confusing. They <laughs> Carbine did release some updates, luckily, and cleared it up. So here's the deal. You'll be able to pre-order the game, the digital copies of the game, through Carbine's first-party sales and their third-party online sales. So you'll, you'll be able to pre-order both the digital version of the regular and the digital deluxe. Brick-and-mortar retailers in North America and in the in EU will have box copies of the $59.99 edition at this time. We, I just showed you the GameStop pre-order deal that we've got going on GameBreaker.tv. That's for the $59.99 box. Now, they will also have the little cards, right, so that you can get, like, a digital copy of the game if for some reason you wanted to leave the house to buy a digital <laughs> copy of the game. I don't know. But they will they will have those, too. So... That kind of eased a lot of tensions, especially in my mind. I wanted to be able to buy a box. I'm still kind of disappointed that there's no, like, official collector's set, though. Yeah, it, that's just, like, shocking to me that they didn't... Like, give me a that. big I... statue of, of crazy eyeball sheep. I don't care what it is. Just put it in a box <laughs> and put a $300 price tag on it if you need to. I was, I'm still really surprised by this. What do you, you think's causing it? 
You know, I'm not sure. I, I can't imagine that it was something where they just, like, dropped the ball and they weren't able to get it, like, manufactured in time. That, that just wouldn't happen. You know, they're, they're a professional enough company that they would have done that if that was the deal. So I, I guess they just decided that, you know, it wasn't worth the, um, you know, monetary commitment to, to actually create those collector's edition boxes and, and go for it. Maybe they just felt like, you know, we aren't going to make enough money off of it to be worth doing that, which... I don't know. That's that's surprising and a little bit just disappointing, right? Like the, the number yeah. one thing I wanted was just to be able to get uh, a copy of the soundtrack, just because yeah. you know if Wildstar has anything going for it, it's a, it has the most amazing soundtrack ever, and yeah. it's, it's sort of a pain. It's to, kind of to... weird. It's kind of disappointing to me. I'm a I'm a collector's yeah. edition baby, uh, so I like those. But at least we are able to get hard physical copies of the game because I. I Fine, if I can't get a collector's edition, I at least want to be able to get the box with the disc and the CD key and all that stuff. And, so, and that's important for some people yeah. who don't have the bandwidth to download the whole game. Yeah. yeah. That's very important for some people. So you yeah. will be able to get that in North America. Like I said, GameStop's already got it up and running. You've uh, you've got the link right on our homepage, gamebreaker.tv. We'll take you over there. We'll get you hooked up with the $59.99, and we'll keep our eyes posted on the $79.99 deluxe version. No word on the street yet on that one, but look for updates uh, on the Game Breaker TV deal that we've got going right there on the homepage. Very cool, very cool, very cool. Now, on the flip side of that... If you have friends in Europe and you're in North America and you would like to play with them, tough luck. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. Pretty much. Uh, Carbine did confirm that the region you buy the game in determines which servers you will be able to play on. No cross-region play confirmed. That kind of sucks. I mean, we're, I'm not used to that even anymore in MMOs. Uh, I've never, yeah, it's, 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 it's been it's a while a, since yeah. they actually really were strict about it to that extent where you can't even have the choice it's, it's just closed off completely and i mean i i sort of wonder if if that's a result of some of the you know in beta testing we are only all on one server for people across the pond and the, everyone here in the u.s we're all running off of their servers in dallas and maybe they just felt like okay the responses we're getting are that you know if there's that much latency it's just never a good experience or, or it's never that good of an experience because i know that you know especially in pvp some of my friends who are playing from europe are having this experience where they're having to run ahead like in front of their target while they're you know hitting their abilities in order to actually have them within their telegraph range so it, it could cause some very strange gameplay experiences when Good you're trying to grief. play that much latency so yeah that gets maybe, a little maybe challenging that's, that's the reason i have no idea but well that was like so. when final fantasy 14 came out you had to anticipate the spells that were going to be cast three seconds from now so that you can get out of the way. Yeah, that's a, yeah. that makes it a bit rough to play the game. And that also led to a second update that Carbine gave, right? Because the, the initial reports were that you would be able to character transfer as a paid service immediately on launch. So people in North America who at the moment thought they couldn't get a physical copy said, I'll buy an EU copy and I'll have my box and then I'll transfer my character. Well... Yes, you can get the box in NA now, so the point is moot. But on the topic of character transfers, might not be there for launch. Not quite confirmed yet. They're working, Carbine is working to get them in there for launch date, but they might not be. So the region you buy in is the region you play in for now, folks. I, I have to think, though, at some point that's going to change. Because to me, that unnecessarily really restricts your player base. And, of course, we're going to see the usual MMO life cycle, right? On launch, the player base is extremely high. The first two months, it falls down cat you know, a huge amount, and then it plateaus for a long time and then goes up or down depending on what you do with expansions. But So we're going to see that typical life cycle. But if you see that with region locking, doesn't that get more pronounced that the servers are empty? The servers are emptying. There, it's harder to find people. And I think that's that's gonna that's that's got to go away at some point. Yeah, I mean, it sort of depends on if they can actually manage that hurdle with the latency problem of you know actually getting the game to actually feel good. Because I mean, that is something that is like you know a physical limitation, like like I mean, like, like physics limitation of there's only so fast that data can transfer across an ocean. And with telegraph combat, you know, maybe they just feel like it's not 
<laughs> worth it for them to be able to. <laughs> Farhan, Farhan was like, Mike, it's just, it's science. It's just <laughs> science. <laughs> it can't go. I mean, I mean it sucks. Happens. It definitely sucks. It if does. you want to play with, with your people and your friends uh, in a different country, you can't really do it very easily. You and know, it, makes, from and Canada, it makes queue then... systems unnecessarily, well, not unnecessarily, but it makes the queue systems longer when the population does do that typical decline that you see a month or two in. Queue times start getting longer and longer because the pool to pull from is is becoming smaller. Uh, now, now, see, but w even if you could like choose to play on a different server, do you think that they would have like the cross realm grouping and stuff actually mix between the two different server sets? Just because I feel like that would be much more difficult, you know, architecturally and just from a latency standpoint. I don't know if you'd want to actually mix in people together. Other games do it. Other games do it, and the only filter they, that I've seen in, in games recently is the ability to select the language that you're willing to play in, and that's what opens up different pools of players. You know, if you're, if you're okay with playing with somebody that speaks German, you, you check that you're okay with English and German, and it opens up the pool of potential players off of potential servers in a queue system. I don't know. I think okay. it's something that, uh, over time... I agree with you that it's a technical limitation. Otherwise, Jeremy Gaffney never would have had it happen. Jeremy's all about get everybody in the sandbox and let them play. Uh, I th I agree with you that it's a technical limitation, but I also think it's one that's gonna it has to go away at some point. Uh, okay, that's fair. Um, and, and, and I do want to say though that you know if people who are concerned about servers feeling a little bit too small or whatever, that unless anything has changed from what they said like months back. From day one, you know, you're going to have cross-realm grouping for everything. So if you are in a raid group and you have a friend who happens to be on another server for some reason, maybe you're, like, you know, doing some sort of recruitment and you just want to try someone out from a different server before they transfer or whatever, you can – that's still all there. As long oh, as you're yeah. within the same oh, definitely. region, you can yeah. still play with each other. Uh, so there's two – we've already talked about it a little bit. There's two editions available, fifty nine ninety nine. Seventy nine ninety nine. Uh, whether you get them digital or the fifty nine ninety nine in a box, really doesn't matter. Let me let me pull up the uh, the image here for you guys on the live stream. Here's the two editions. We can see all the little the little extras here for twenty bucks. Guest passes are probably the smartest thing I've seen on here. Yeah. Uh, That's definitely I've always really wondered cool. why more don't more games don't do that at launch. I mean, World of Warcraft does that now. If you if you buy their software, you get guest passes for other so pieces of software. Uh, you, you buy StarCraft, uh, then there's guest passes in there for StarCraft and WoW, uh, which makes a lot of sense to me, but nobody does it off of launch. This is ridiculously smart to do off of launch, I think. Yeah, I, I think Wildstar, you know, Carbine, they know what they're getting into. They know that they are up against these giants in the yep. industry, and they are, you know, for all intents and purposes, a completely unheard of IP. For for the, the vast majority of gamers who aren't watching this show, they don't know who Carbine are. They don't know what Wildstar is. So having, you know, each person be like a, you know, St uh, a reaching off point where you yeah. gum off. Because they're going to need person us gets to it, sell we'll it. Have four people trying the game. The game's yep. great. Yeah, there you go. They're going to need us to sell it, us as being the yeah. players, to sell this game to, to other people. And you're right. I mean, it's an unknown IP, so you need all the, the word of mouth you can get. The bonus is, what do you think? Are you are you getting uh, – let me, let me backtrack here. I know you're getting the deluxe edition. I know, <laughs> you're like me. I know you are. But as a general player – well, Wait, oh, I'm on. sorry. I didn't mean to offend you by saying you were like me. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Actually, like, like, honestly, this digital deluxe, like, I don't know. I mean, maybe it's because, like, the extent of what I know about the Elden-themed hoverboard is this, like, 5 by 25 pixel thing of the hoverboard there so i can't actually see it and actually want it at all but wait for now, I'm like, a minute wait a minute are you telling me that farhan Siddiqui, host of unicorn duck shadow puppet might not in fact be buying the deluxe edition well i mean like they make the decision pretty easy for me by making it you know 15 dollars higher than the regular one I, I can just be like okay i'll pay five bucks more and get a cred and just be ahead of the game in the econ <laughs> i'll have the money wow I'm shocked. Uh, I, however, am an idiot, and I'll be getting the deluxe edition. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you got that Elden theme hoverboard. Right. I, I want so the hoverboard. Uh, Pre-purchasing either edition does get you beta access, uh, three days head start, a 10-slot box, a rocket house, some cosmetics, 
And most yeah, importantly... Yeah, honestly, like, if they switched the Deluxe Edition and the pre-order bonuses, I'd be buying the, the Deluxe Edition because <laughs> I want the Rocket House. But, <laughs> hey, I'm okay. I just pre order <laughs> You also, importantly, get the ability to reserve character and guild names before launch. So yeah. I told Farhan before the show, I've already reserved Siddiqui Fan. I've already reserved, named a guild Guild Umbra. And then I'm just going to Domain Squat. And if you want to give me a little cred, <laughs> I'll go ahead and... Destroy those, and you can, you can have. Them. Mark would be so mad at me. Oh my god, he would be. <laughs> he would be furious at me. I would never do that. Never do that. Yeah, but but that, it, that it's totally worth pre-ordering just to troll to troll your friends, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's the beat. Uh, maybe, maybe I missed this somewhere in there, but I just like thought of something. Like, if we are able to reserve character names now, does that mean we have to choose our server now? Or our ser our names cross server? Uh, sure. I'm gonna go with I don't know. Oh, I, I didn't see that in any music. I didn't either. Something to ask. Something to ask. It's definitely a good follow-up question, Chad. If you know, throw the throw the answer in there, uh, chat box for Farhan there. Uh, I would assume so. You yeah, know, since it's gonna be, be, it's gotta sort be of a big, yeah, it's big a big choice. Deal. Would we see the number of servers right from next Wednesday then? Yeah, I mean that's a good point. Very good question. Chad, if you know it, throw it in the box below. If you're watching on YouTube and you know the answer, throw it in the comments below. Uh, if you're looking at pre-ordering this bad boy, check it out. Gamebreaker.tv homepage. Go ahead and get your pre-order on. We've got a link right there for you. A lot of people with uh, us at Gamebreaker having a bit of a hard time right now and doing the GoFundMe ask, hey, I can't donate, but how can I support Game Breaker? Well, when we get these deals and we get our sponsors and stuff like that, support these deals. If it's a game you're interested in, like Wildstar, you're watching the show, pre-orders now live, use the links that we supply you. It gives you, you a great deal and it supports Game Breaker. So a nice alternate way to help out Game Breaker uh, if you can't contribute to the, the GoFundMe uh, fundraising that we're doing right now. On that note, Damn it, I, so one of these days I will remember to cue your camera up first before I come back to that <laughs> shot. <laughs> On that note, the NDA is gone. Ka kaput, thrown out, Just dropped. Gone. And so I'm going to turn this over to you. You're going to lead the discussion here. What have you, because okay. I know you've wanted to talk about things, and we've talked offline, both being in the beta, about things we can't talk about on the show. Now you can. What do you want everybody to know? What features are you really excited about? What are you loving? What are you hating? Tell us about it. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll save the war plot stuff for when we talk about war plots very soon. So yeah, I'll just hold off on that. Don't worry, it's coming. But the uh, for, as far as you know, general NDA drop stuff. One thing that you know I've been really struggling with that I want to be able to talk about like with everyone in, in the show and everything is that one of the things I've been most impressed uh, impressed with with Carbine. It's just been the way that they iterate through through some of their designs, and 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 I know that some of the things are a little bit shaky. Spell slingers are a little bit shaky right now. I'm, I'm not going to deny that. Um, other stuff like that, class balance in general is actually just yep. sort of what the hell. But <laughs> you know, like like it, it it's on a very clear trajectory. Like we, I I can sort of predict like okay. It seems like it's going in the correct direction, and and I can see that where they're going with this. And I was tweeting out a little bit earlier today about how impressed I was specifically with with the medic because medic is sort of the class my class of choice, and it's what I put the most effort into personally, in terms of uh, just giving feedback and and sort of getting the feel for how it's going to work and everything. And you know, like like somebody in chat was actually asking like, can we see your spreadsheets now? That. Uh, <laughs> Now that the NDA has dropped, and, and, and you know, I'll, I'll try to think of some way to, to show it in some way that's not completely boring. It's like, I've got to clean numbers. them up. I've got to make them look presentable before I give you access to the spreadsheet. You know, not to mention that today's patch just, like, changed everything. Just a, so, just a little. Just, just a little bit. I have, to, I have to update a few numbers. But, yeah. Uh, one thing, but what I've been really impressed with, though, is just, like, as far as the meta goes, I put in a lot of my, you know, like, personal time into making spreadsheets, analyzing the data, and, and putting it into, like, you know, cohesive posts on the on the forums. 
And while, you know, there's been some bumps in terms of getting some feedback back from them, like, okay, they're listening, but, like, we're not really hearing, like, a ton back from them all, all the time. You know, it sort of depends on which which department. You know, some, some of them, like, the rates team has actually been amazing in terms of just constantly giving feedback and sort of being like, oh, okay, this is what we're working, okay, this is what we're intending to do, this is that kind of thing. And, and so that's been really great to see. But especially with the, med like, like, I feel like the patch today just sort of resolved all of the issues that I had been really concerned about with the medic. Like, I mean, the numbers obviously need to still be balanced, but as far as like core mechanics go for the medic, I am really, really happy with where they ended up. You read like, the patch notes patch. And, and you shed a little tear. I, I know, I was, I was just like, oh my God. <laughs> That was a change I suggested, and that one, and that one, and that one, and that one. I mean, like, I'm not going to take credit for it. It's like, no, oh, yeah, dude, dude it was totally you. Stop. <laughs> it was totally you. It was all you. Take the credit where it's due. Let me ask you a couple questions then. Okay. Because the way I've been dabbling in the Wildstar beta has been, I, I guess the best way to put it has been a little reserved. Uh, I haven't it's gone gung-ho into Wildstar, because not only am I playing, like, three other MMOs and then nine other games, and, God, Titanfall just came out <laughs> two days ago, and I am terrible at it, but addicted to it. So, it's hard. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is challenging to, to get... Anyway, totally different show. Uh, <laughs> so, I've been dabbling in the Wildstar beta. I haven't really been playing hardcore. So, I want to know a couple of things here. I'm really a PvE guy. We've talked about that. I like where we're going to talk later in the show about dungeons and raids and things like that that they're doing. That's all great, well and good. I'm excited about that stuff. Can I say, is it fair to say that to me, the leveling of the character has of my character has been relatively boring? Uh, and I don't know oh, that's if that's just, you know, okay, it's the first 10 levels, it's the first 15 levels, it's the first 20 levels, whatever, if it's that whole beginning of the game. I don't want to knock it because I'm having fun playing it. It's, it's not like I'm like, oh, crap, I don't want to play this. I just want to get to the level. I'm enjoying the game, but I'm not, I'm not feeling compelled to play it, I guess is a good way to put it. Am I alone on that one? No, no, definitely not. You're, you're actually, like, spot on with probably like the the biggest obstacle that carbine has going for it is that the, the the leveling experience the questing experience is actually like a little bit drab just just because like it's it's so easy to just fall into the motions and just be like okay I'm going to do it and I'm going to do it I'm going to do it and it just feels a little like repetitive because it's so easy to just click through the text it's so easy to just not get like any of the information of what's going on in the storyline and just be questing and, and and I mean you know like real talk you know, here, like, I love the game, and I, I and I like playing it a lot. And like I was just saying, like, uh, I don't remember if it was in the pre-show or what, but, uh, you know, the whole, like, losing your character thing in, in beta, like, that's obviously a big obstacle for a lot of people who are playing in beta, that they feel like, oh, I'm going to lose my character. It's just, you know, sort of crippling. I don't want to put in my time, but the thing is that, you know, for me personally, I'm, like, such an ultaholic. I like creating new characters anyway and just trying stuff out and, and getting in it. Like, Guild Wars 2 was, like, my dream game as far as being able to just have, like, a, you know, going to the, the, the mists and just having a max level character with everything and just being able to play with it constantly. That was, that was amazing for me. But in Wildstar, like, I'm actually feeling that pressure still, even though I'm, like, usually pretty easy for me to just be like, okay, well, I'm gonna lose my character it's not a big deal i'm having fun and the thing is that i still feel that pressure where i'm like uh this feels the questing is not really grabbing me in the way that it should be grabbing me because when i actually sit down like like you know i actually wrote an add-on uh called what i call lore reader and what it does is like have you seen that like speed reading thing where like it flashes one word at a time really oh quickly? yeah 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 yeah. and it's just yeah, like 250 so 350 an or 550 so that i could just words. read all of the the quest decks really really quickly <laughs> <laughs> and it and it actually is like wow the, the lore in this game is actually pretty good it's actually pretty interesting please pretty tell me that you are lying right now you did not build an add-on to speed read quest text for you not quest text the journal text like oh, the all of the little <laughs> bits of... it did it's, it's been received pretty well hey hey it was like a night, whatever. Anyway, we we but, are absolute we are absolute dorks. I will tell you that <laughs> because not only did you make it, but I'm sitting here going, "Shit, I could really use that." <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> They're total because dorks. There's like so much lore that's in the game, but it's just I like I know, it's, and that's the shame of it is 
I, but I, it's I, all I presentation. It's, it's because yeah, because the, the quest text is, is funny. The quest text is funny. Yeah. Some of the responses yeah. that your character makes or that NPCs makes to you, they're downright hysterical. The game gets raunchy at times and makes some <laughs> sly, dirty jokes. I mean, it is clever humor all the way. But I found myself, like, once I hit level 6, 7, 8, and I'm starting to, okay, now we're beginning the grind to the level, I found myself not even compelled to read that knowing that there were funny things that I was missing by just clicking through it. I, I don't know, and I don't know what they can change at this point either, uh, because I think everybody's draw is, I mean, is you know, the so, war so plots and the raids and stuff at this point. I, I think I think it's two things as far as what the uh, what's making the lore really hard to actually grab you and get into it. One is the presentation is is bad, like it, it has been. I don't know if that's something that they're going to tweak with the UI. I really really hope it is because that is like, the font is not great. So many times it's like. Like a lot of the lore and the little bits of, of like interaction stuff is in chat bubbles, right? Right. And the chat bubble is like slightly transparent because it's a chat bubble. It's not like, you know, a, a big yeah. thing. So it's hard to read because you have, you know, sort of a small font in a very light, you know, color and, and style on a tr transparent background. And it's just, it's just really, really bad presentation in terms of, of so it makes it difficult to actually even get into it. It's just this obstacle that doesn't need to be there, and, and it's it's really frustrating. It's something that I've looked into trying to mod to try to improve, but it's it's actually really difficult because the way that it's been designed, so much of quest text is happening in different places. When when you talk to an NPC, their little the the quest thing comes up in a little chat bubble above their head because that is like you know it's like this nice little immersive ish kind of thing that where they're trying to make it a chat bubble instead of like a separate quest window, right? But the problem is that now you have that there, then you have your responses in a chat bubble that's attached to your head. And if you turn the camera, then everything sort of starts moving around because it's all attached to your character. And then you have like another little, like the calm thing where they give you a phone call or whatever. And that's over here. And so you're like reading this and this and this, and it's just like all over the place. But all of that said, if you actually get into it, then it's actually really, really good. Like the, the oh, storylines totally are really agree. brilliant. I absolutely and agree. The thing is, especially when you get to higher levels, this becomes all the more apparent. Like, like it actually gets a little bit worse in some ways, because like in some of the higher levels, I'm not going to spoil an actual like storyline because I've, I think the storylines are important and, and, and interesting. And you know, obviously, I don't want to spoil it for oh, someone. Go ahead, spoil it. Carbine doesn't care. The game's not even out yet. <laughs> <laughs> but there's there's like one quest line in particular that's really really important, and it sets up a bunch of stuff going in forward all the way into like the 20-man raid and it's a kill quest like it's a really really interesting like it like it's explained the origin of this thing that thing that but it's so easy just because if you look at just what the objective is and you don't really care about what you're killing then it's kill 10 of these walk over there kill five of those do a holdout where you're defending this thing over here if you don't know what you're defending then you don't realize how important it is how interesting this thing is how important that other thing is and it's, I don't know what to say because it's something that it's actually, like, the questing experience is actually really good, but it's just presented so poorly, I, I don't know. See, I don't even know if I can go that far with you. I don't think the general questing experience is all that great. I think it's average. I think it's, it's uh, the norm, I think would be a good way to put it for MMOs. The general quest beeline through an area is generally what well, they're doing in, well, in I most the sections. I, I mean, the, I mean the actual like storylines that are, yeah. that are going. Through if you're reading them, the thing. Yeah, and yeah. that comes you, that comes you're... to your point of presentation, where yeah. this is the presentation that we're used to from eight to ten years ago, and would have flown totally back back then. But now with cutscenes and voice acting the way they are in MMOs more recently, it it feels older when you when you go to play at the presentation i don't know i'm not bitching the about the game i'm think... enjoying it i'm i'm having fun in it absolutely i'm gonna buy the digital deluxe edition uh i'm a big fan of it but to me that section of the game just feels like a chore at least yeah. right now and and, it, and like i was saying it was, it's two things and, and this is coming up in chat like people are saying like uh d amp is saying you know whatever lore i want to get to max level and go to rating or whatever this is the second part of it, is that the presentation is sort of not that great. That was the first part. The second part is that it's long. Yes. It takes so long to level. Yep. 
And, and I mean, like, to be fair, if you're actually like just talking in terms of content and, and wanting to actually see a lot of the content, there's more than enough content to level you up, especially if you're going to do some dungeons, if you're going to do some adventures, if you're going to do some, all those other things. And, and I want to say that the actual like experience of, of doing a dungeon or doing an adventure is way stronger than the, the solo quest experience. Like, like it's, it's actually much, much more interesting. But the problem is that it, it still just takes so long that it feels yeah. like, oh my god, I have been playing, doing the same questing experience, just clicking through everything for hours now. And, yep. like, and, and that's, the, much of a dent. that's the trade-off that I'm having a hard time with. I don't mind if it takes me forever to get to max level in a game because there's just so much to do and the experience is low or whatever. I mean, I remember the older MMOs where it took forever to gain one level, let alone 50. I'm okay with a slower leveling curve if I have a compelling experience. But I, right I now, say, I, I've got the slower leveling curve and I don't have a necessarily compelling experience. So it's it's kind of a toss-up for me on that one. The one saving thing that I have, just I want to say because I've been saying a lot of like just sort of negative stuff about the leveling experience so far, is that, you know, whenever I, like, like I've been feeling this pressure where I don't want to actually start playing the game because of all these thoughts of, oh, it's sort of it's going to take me so long and I'm going to do this. I could just be writing another add-on instead, which will be, you know, useful for a launch or whatever, all these other thoughts. Once I actually get playing into the game, like, like recently I was playing an Esper, and, and I'm not, like, a huge fan of the Esper personally. Like, I don't think I've been secretive about that at all. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I just started playing it, and I was like, okay, I, I was level 28, and I was like, okay, I want to try to just level up as much as I can get through Farsight, which, like, extends to, like, around level 33 or so. And I, once I started playing it, though, once I started, because I enjoy the combat so much, and the mobs are, are, are really, really fun and interesting to fight against. The, I actually enjoy the challenge system. Uh, I know a lot of people don't, who, where, where it's sort of like you're fighting some mobs and it suddenly gives you a timer and it's like, okay, kill as many as you can at, and in this much time and try to, to do it or whatever. And you'll get some extra rewards, you get some experience, you get a little bit of extra gold. I actually like doing those things. Once I actually get playing in it, I just, the hours pass by. And, and I've leveled up a decent amount, especially with the rest experience, with the housing and with everything else that I have, you know, like to help get through the experience a little bit quicker. But the combat is actually so engaging. It's like, like I feel like the leveling experience still is okay for me. Like it's not, I wouldn't call it like an A. I wouldn't give it an A. I would yeah, call it like I've said twice, I, I think it's average. Yeah, I, I would say like a, like a, around like a B, B minus overall, but it's because the combat is like an A plus for me. Yeah. It's so much fun to actually be killing mobs that I'm able to get through it. I'm able to actually play it. And, 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 I, it. Agree. and I feel like if they resolve some of the presentation stuff, it'll suddenly become like a B plus, A minus. And, and I'll say this too. I mean, that was that's my one big gripe with the game. And I you, you have those with every game is that the, the general questing leveling experience feels average to me. On the other hand, I agree with you that not only do I find the combat compelling enough to drag me through that, I also find about 900 other things to go and do before I realize I haven't completed a quest in 40 minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's definitely... So like, there's you don't there's have no to shortage of stuff to do. I've gotten tied up in crafting for hours. I've gotten tied up in my role for hours and go do some exploring and stuff like that. I mean, it's it's very compelling. It, the game is a ton of fun. I mean, it yeah. just really is. Yeah, okay, I'll deal with average questing because damn, there's just so much other stuff for me to do and I'm only level 8 or level 15 or whatever. Uh, and then I know that the dungeons and the raids and the war plots and the war parties and all that stuff is coming as, as I move up here. Now, we're going to get into raids and war plots in particular in a little bit here, but I want to ask you, since I haven't had any personal experience with this, tell us a little bit about the dungeons now that we can talk about them. Okay, so most of the dungeon experiences are pretty... Pretty straightforward. Like, like if you've seen uh, Storm Talon, you've seen Kelvareth now um, in multiple places, the YouTube videos and uh, streamers or whatever. Uh, you you get the idea of what they're doing with dungeons. They they you have a pretty contained experience that has like some interesting story elements. You have some interesting things, but the boss fights are by far the most 
engaging part of them, right? The, the trash is actually pretty engaging too because they they do some interesting mechanics and do some interesting things. But it's really the boss fights that when the whole combat system just clicks. Like, why did we do telegraphs? Why did we do all this stuff? It's just because of this. They can do so many more interesting. Like, you know, like I was playing Elder Scrolls online recently with some of the stuff, and like, oh, like, oh, look, they have a telegraph. That's so adorable. You know, after playing Wildstar. Oh, seeing, oh, wait, Elder Scrolls. Can... You mean that game that you're going to be done with sixty days? Yeah. After. Yeah, the that one, one. The one that no. you're basically paying a dollar per day to play and then just being <laughs> done with it. A, well, I, I mean, like, I, I didn't know that Elder Scrolls had telegraphs. And then I saw like, right. the red thing on the ground. I was like, oh, that's that's cute <laughs> that they have that. Because it's just like the level of what they do with telegraphs in these dungeons are just, it's just like it's mind blowing that some of the stuff that they can do because it really determines so much of the content, so much of this ability is actually only viable because it fits in with the way that combat works and, and so forth. Um, I think the dungeons are a brilliant experience. It's actually really, really, really challenging. Even just going regular dungeons, let alone veteran dungeons. Veteran dungeons are, are, are great because they actually add some extra mechanics into the, the fight instead of it just being more health, more damage, whatever. Um, so that there's more things to juggle. Maybe you have to manage two different mechanics at the same time as opposed to having them, you know, one at a time in regular mode or whatever. And, and that's actually doable. It's, it, it actually is a, an execution thing. That's one thing that is very apparent in Wildstar. Gear is obviously important. You know, gearing up will increase little. your damage. It'll Just increase your survivability. It'll increase your healing. But execution is still the, the number one thing. You actually have to be on top of your game in order to actually succeed in these dun in the dungeons and in, you know, going forward the raids. So. Yeah, and Wildstar has been a slow burn for me in that respect. I look for good dungeons and, and raiding content and that stuff. I'm the PvE dog on the show here. You're, you're the one who wants to kill me in PvE, PvP, <laughs> because you're such a nice guy, Farhan Siddiqui. Uh <laughs> But so I look for that type of content, and they really, Carbine has kind of kept that under lock and key until literally today in, in a lot of cases. Yeah. So my hype level for Wildstar today at like 9 or 10 Eastern or whenever the articles went up was just like, slow burn, yeah, I'm going to play it, I'm going to buy it to, oh shit, June 3rd, man, that's so long, that's so far away. <laughs> I need to be playing this now. So I'm going to hop back into beta, of course, now, right? Now that I've read more about this, I'm going to be messing around in there. And you heard it here first, yeah. gang. Mr. Farhan is making, has made an add-on that if you want, if you don't want <laughs> For speed if, reading lore. If you there don't want to read it, you can just uh, have it read to you very quickly uh, through speed reading. But if you're even uh, opposed to that and you want somebody to read to you, we can't do it with Wildstar lore, <laughs> but we can do it with the Audible segue for Great the win. Segue. I saw that coming. I was like, oh, yes, that's what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of you guys ask with uh, the GoFundMe.com, how can we help Game Breaker? I've donated. I want to help out in other ways, or maybe I can't donate. One big way you can do it is by supporting our sponsors. Today's show is brought to you by Audible. We're giving away a 30-day free trial. If you head on over to Audible.com, forward slash game breaker and when you do that you're going to get a free book too the service is very easy to use it'll read the books to you i've pulled up a little carl sagan today in honor of the new cosmos series which was pretty badass uh enjoying that so far so a little carl sagan we got some contact here 14 hours you could be listening to a fantastic book uh, one of the classics. Love Carl Sagan. Check it out. Easy site to use. Come on, get your book, and let's uh, take a little listen on contact. On a brisk March day, and it stopped before a store window. Inside, a burgundy red stone was glistening in the sunlight. Jew-wo-ler. Ellie read slowly, pronouncing three syllables. Guiltily, she let herself into the spare room. The old Motorola radio was on the shelf where she remembered it. It was very big. I love when the readers get into it and they have their own voices for all the different characters. Uh, also, if you are a Kindle user and you happen to have a book on the Kindle that you also get on Audible, some books have a 
feature called Whisper Sync that allows you to seamlessly transition from you reading your Kindle version to Audible reading the book to you and then back to you reading it uh, on your Kindle version. So no more setting a good book down to go make dinner. You can just have it read to you while you're making dinner and then come on back. Check out audible.com forward slash Game Breaker. Get your free 30 days. Get your free audiobook. Help support Game Breaker by supporting our sponsors. We love you. We love you. We love you. Audible, very happy to have them on as a sponsor. Moving on. Damn it. I did it again with your camera. Oh, my (laughs) God. Three for three today. Moving on. We still got a ton more to talk about, gang. We're probably going to go a little over an hour today. Uh, The devs have been making all kinds of words all over the internets here. Now, they have, Carbine has confirmed an aggressive content schedule with about a month in between patches after launch. And if today's patch notes are any judge, (laughs) that's probably right. Because when you actually mosey on over and look at the patch notes, they're a good 40 to 50 pages long or so. It's it's quite the book. So we can expect raids. I I think that Scooter said it was like, before he condensed it into the format that we see, it was 98 pages in in Word. Oh, jeez. So a yeah, lot plan to sift through them. We can expect raids, uh, dungeons, battlegrounds between actual expansions. So we won't have to wait for expansions for those big content items to drop, which I think goes to what Jeremy is, has been saying a lot of, where they've installed that that type of plug-in mentality, right? Where yeah. they have the ability to go onto a live server and trigger an event that causes the environment to change in some way. Uh, One of the examples he used was we have the ability to go in and throw a meteor uh, onto the planet that just totally destroys a mountain and exposes a bunch of stuff underneath of it that was previously inaccessible. We don't have to shut the servers down to do that type of stuff. We can do that in real time and have it be events. So it kind of makes sense that they would also have the capability to be adding raids and dungeons and battlegrounds and more full-scale items like that without it necessarily having to be an expansion, right? That's kind of just a, a nice byproduct, isn't it? Yeah, I, I think that it's definitely something that, you know, most of us expected. It is, you know, if you're going to pay the subscription, then you sort of expect that, okay, I'm not going to wait till the next expansion to have just a dungeon added to the game or another battleground. And I'm very happy that, you know, that they're deciding to go with about a month in between. That, that's been working out quite well for them in, in beta. They, they've been at that about that pace there was a couple times where they were like a couple weeks over maybe it was like five weeks or six weeks in, in between patches instead of four but it's still pretty solid and like the, the amount of content if they keep up the pace that they're at which is a big if you know honestly like how many studios actually manage to continue to produce at the same pace that they, they do it depends quite a bit on how successful launch is and if they can keep everyone on you know which you know are you are you cool with four hoping. weeks i mean uh, assuming a month four weeks whatever i know it's not exactly four but around four to five weeks per patch are you happy with that kind of cadence coming out i think i think it's been working out great for them so far in beta i, I think that each about every month we're seeing like a very solid chunk of content coming into the game and and, and starting to get polished and then you know getting it done obviously they're gonna have to do it to the next level when it's post-launch they can't just release like a sort of a buggy mess and then sort of you know (laughs) fix it up after the fact it's got to be released you know ready kind of kind of thing which hopefully you know they're getting more into the groove i think i think four weeks is kind of perfect actually yeah when when you look at it four to five weeks is perfect because we've seen one end of the spectrum in in earlier days of blizzard and and still even now to a certain extent where the the time between big patches is so long that there's nobody doing content anymore uh just waiting for the new patch but on the flip side of that we've seen guild wars 2 releasing living story and things like that every two weeks roughly and people complaining that, man, this is way too fast. Kind of funny when you think about it. People bitching about too much content. But, but well, I've been part of that was the timed yeah, nature of the content. You couldn't right, just enjoy you it. You can't just do it at your own pace. If you don't get in there, you're out of luck for it. <laughs> so we've seen both ends of the spectrum. I kind of dig four to five weeks. That's a perfect yeah. schedule to me. And it's, it's definitely not going to be like too fast for most players just because you know they, they did say that they will alternate it's not like it's, we're getting a raid a dungeon and a battleground every month or whatever it's, it's gonna be like okay this month we've got like a battleground coming in next month maybe we've got a dungeon coming in or uh, or whatever and so uh, at, at that pace i think that they can actually proceed and 
I really hope so because you know a, a, a number of the things that people have been concerned about are like okay, well we only got four dungeons at launch, and and I mean they still have the adventures content. A lot of people you know are a little bit shaken about whether or not they can count adventures as solid dungeon content. I think that they can. I think that they overlap enough why in not? terms of. I yeah why not? Yeah yeah exactly. Me, it makes sense. That uh you know that it's five man content. Yeah. There's enough PVE five man content I feel for launch, but if they come out with stuff about every month or two or you know like, let's say that it's every three months that you get a new dungeon, I think that's great. You know that that'd be yeah. more than enough for me personally. So I'm cool with that because and even with Final Fantasy 14, which you got you know I play a lot of right now. The, the big content patches are typically about three months apart right now, which has led to that last month, month and a half being... A little painful. <laughs> you know, I log into Raid, and that's it. Uh, you know, yeah. it's... So I, I'm all for, like, a four- to a six-week time window. Now, when speaking of Raids, when it comes to raiding, Carbine doesn't want us to be doing the same things for every encounter, and this is the really intriguing part of me, of raids to me that we've heard teased over and over and over and over again. So it was really nice to get some more detail about it today. They'd want to mix things up, split your groups up, introduce crazy mechanics. Again, all stuff we've heard. From what you've seen personally in the game so far, do you think they can pull this off? I think they can. I think that it's just a matter of, you know, introducing enough scripted events. It's sort of choosing between that from week to week, it feels a little bit fresh. It's like, oh, okay, this is what we're dealing with. Okay, we can mix things up. It, it, it's not nearly to like the level that some people hyped it up to be where it's like, oh, it's going to be completely different every single week or whatever. But it, it is something where I think on a week to week basis, they can definitely change up some of the contents just so that it's it's a little bit more fresh instead of it being exactly a hundred percent routine every single week that there is that rotation and and you know like hopefully they sort of grow into it a little bit more hopefully they add more yep. to the raid encounters going forward where there is a little bit even more variety with within each encounter well, to, to me even that's without. somewhat exciting it, you know going yeah. into a raid this week and and you know the example in, in justin's article that he wrote up was the say a raid has a total of six bosses but mm -hmm. they only spawn in combinations of two, you know. So any that was given actually week, like for a single encounter. I yeah, believe. just one encounter yeah. it could have six different bosses that would spawn mm -hmm. for the encounter, and you get two, and it could mix and match every single time you go in there each week. It would it could be a different combination. That's really intriguing. That's I, that's a really exciting part of raiding for me is that it's not going to be the exact same thing. Go in, go kill A, B, C. You're done for the week. I like the idea of oh, it's five weeks in, and we've got a combination I've never seen. You know, because that's perfectly something that could happen, right? With with that type of mix, mix and match mentality. Especially with uh, how Carbine are going to be supported competitive rating, which I am by no means a competitive raider, right? I'm not taking world first anytime soon, but each week raiders will have something meaningful to do since they're going to long-term be... So Supporting that competitive mentality. This just sounds badass. Yeah, the the competitive rating thing, I think, is something that they said that unfortunately won't be able to make it for launch. Not for launch. But it is no. something that they still have the plans like in, in the works for. That you know they'll be able to come up with like a goal, like maybe like a specific challenge or a specific kind of thing, like do it in this order, do this kind of special, like sort of like a you know the. Uh, to, to put it in World of Warcraft terms, like the Ulduar kind of hard modes kind of thing, maybe something like that, where you have like sort of a different mechanic twist on it to make it a little bit more difficult. I, I'm speculating here a little bit on, on terms of exactly how it'll work, but you know, <laughs> the idea is that they have some sort of a challenge that would change on a week-to-week -week basis and people could compete to see, okay, who can do that beyond simply just the one world-first race, which, I, which is, I think, a huge, huge step forward in terms of uh, making rating engaging for the hardcore players long term because okay you have the world world first race that's really really draining obviously the world first race is so 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 difficult to actually engage in and actually be competitive in it requires a very very specific skill set that not everyone wants to do but maybe you have competitive guilds that want to do some of this other stuff that maybe will be changing on a week-to-week -week basis. They have leaderboards or whatever they end up doing. I think that that's something that's going to be really exciting to see what they actually end up coming up with. On your side of the content pond, the PvE, PvP side, the PvP side, 
We're getting more information, more and more about war plots. Yay. Yep. So here's some of the breakdown we got. To to enter a war plot, you're going to need a war party. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the way to think about war parties is they're a permanent entity. So I, I guess you could it'd be safe to consider them a type of guild, right? It's not a guild, but that's that fair. type of mentality. You'll have ranks and permissions on who can edit and move and do all the fun stuff inside your war plot. So you'll have all that stuff. Now, we're not sure what the max size yet is, but we do know the min, you're going to need at least 40, which makes yeah. sense because the war plots require teams of 40. Now, I'm not sure if, if the war party itself like has a minimum, hard set minimum of... Uh, 40 members in order to actually like just get going into it. I think you can actually queue up with a little bit less and just hope that the mercenaries will fill in. Some right, of right, 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 um, right. Uh, yeah. But that's to actually join uh, to join a match. I think to create a war party, you need at least 40, though. At least if I'm reading no, some of the no. stuff I'm you, seeing. At least I don't know if that's something that's different for beta, but you can actually create it with a, with, with a less than 40. Less. That might be something just for beta where oh, wow. they are loosening it up. But I don't know. Yeah, it's uh, PvP. I don't know what the hell I'm talking about anyway. So, <laughs> I, I don't know. Actually, you know. War Parties kind of intrigues me. So, uh, moving on just a little bit. The War Parties, 40 people, kind of a nice approach. You mentioned mercenaries, which we'll get into in, in a minute. But this seems like kind of a smart way to do it. Not everybody in your guild is going to be interested in PvP. So, a War Party kind of gets those like-minded people together in maybe a subgroup of your guild, right? I think it's just a nice way to, to balance everything out and keep everybody together. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's definitely, like... And you maybe you'll have, like, an alliance set up because War Parties obviously have their War Plot associated with them. Like, a single War Party owns a War Plot that, you know, has their plugs or things. And there is maintenance costs and other actual, like... You know, real life, like, if your plug is destroyed within one patch, you actually have to repair it between matches or whatever. Otherwise, you're going into the next match with the broken down, sort of needing repairs or whatever. So there is, like, a very real association that there should be, like, a connection between your war party and your war plot. So that is why it is, like, its own entity. And, you know, they'll own one. Maybe two guilds, two smaller guilds might share a war, uh, uh, a war plot. You'd have still one owner of the thing, whoever founded the war plot or whatever. But you'd have permissions and ranks and whatever so that you could set everything up in some way. So, no. yeah, it, it's a really nice system. It's very uh, clean in, in terms of... The organization, I think, is Here, pretty solid. Here's where it gets better, though. There's two types of ranking going on when these war plots collide. Yeah. And to, to, to clarify, I misread a sentence in Justin's piece. I'm, I was reading the queuing up, you need 40, 40 people, yeah. not the actual creation of the war party. Apologies, yeah. chat room, that's my mistake. I, I misread a sentence. Uh, so sue me. I made a mistake. Uh, but... There's actually going to be dual ranking going on here. And this, I think, is really cool. So first off, how you guys do as a war party will net you one type of ranking points and, and achievement there. But you personally are also being measured as well in, in an independent individual ranking. Why? So that you can queue up as a mercenary and they can put you into like-skilled war parties that aren't full. So when Farhan, you queue up with 35 and you need five fillers, it's going to try and find individuals that hold ranking that are on par with your team's ranking so that you can expect the people you're picking up, you're not going to get any Mike Burns. You know, <laughs> you guys <laughs> you guys have been PvPing for six months. You're way, way up there in the rankings. You're not going to pick up any Mies that's PvP'd a dozen times and just decided it's Saturday night on board. I'm going to queue up for a few war plots. You're going to get. But hey, there will be another war that plot skill level. That, that is at that skill level. That yeah, they can there's going to be terrible into. war plots out there. I'll have plenty of people. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have plenty of people to queue up with. Don't worry about me. But I'm not going to be bringing your game down. This is a really, really cool feature. I love yeah, yeah. this implementation. I, I think that that was like the thing I was really really concerned about, specifically for war plots for for queuing up purposes, like getting all forty people together. Like, I mean, like obviously in a raid, it's a little bit different because okay, raids are it's, it's obviously still going to be difficult to to herd forty people into a group and, and and get them into the door and 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 going in your raid. But for a war plot, it's like it's like a PVPers are 
a different bunch that they're even harder to wrangle everyone up into and, and, and get going into the uh, into the group and, and queued up and going with them. So that was like something I was like, oh, how are they going to do it? And then it, it was just like, oh, yeah, duh. Why not just have mercenaries, have people who can queue up and do, do other things? There are some things that I'm a little bit um, concerned about as far as the current implementation goes. Like if you are a war party owner, you can't actually mercenary for someone else. Like, let's say your group isn't ready, you still want to do some more plots. Right now, I don't think you can. Uh, th maybe that's something that is just sort of like a, oh, oops, right? We should probably let people do that kind of thing. But yeah, I, I, I think that that would be important that you should be able to mercenary for someone else, even if you're, if it's just, okay, the, tonight my group wasn't ready to do it yeah. kind of thing. Let me go somewhere else. But do, do that, you, that's like a small concern. I think that they can handle. What that about the scary. objectives? Uh, I mean, obviously, blow okay. blow shit up is going to be important. <laughs> what else are we so, we going to see though? So war plots, you know, just to to do like a a mini deep dive into exactly how they function. Um, you got your two war plots, and each war plot has I think seven or eight uh, slots that you can plug in different things like you might have a hazard, like you might have like a nuclear power plant or whatever that's letting off you know, toxic waste or whatever, and so that is a hazard that people will have to try to walk through or whatever, and it'll damage them or whatever, and it won't. Somehow it doesn't hurt your people. <laughs> <laughs> Magic, you know, whatever. But, but basically, like, you can design your warp plot, and you decide which plots you want to do. Some of them will summon guards that will, uh, you know, either defend your things, or you can make, like, uh, offensive kind of NPCs. That it'll, it, it basically spawns, you know... Uh, I guess like a good example would be to compare it to like a, a Dota match or whatever, where you have like the creeps that sort of just wander across and start attacking the other base. You can spawn those basically if if you choose to make a plug that would do that. Um, you can make transportation plugs that will actually like help you get to the fight quicker. Like you can you know rocket into the enemy base or teleport between parts of your own base or, or do things like that. So, so there's options like that. And uh, there's also like passive plugins that would just like give you buffs. So like when you're defending, you have higher deflection chance or whatever, or more damage or whatever. So you got the, those plugins. That's like the, the basis of designing your war plot. The actual objective is either the, the, there's two ways to win. You have destroying the enemy generators. So uh, each war plot has two generators within it that uh, are, I guess, creating the energy or whatever. And if you destroy both of them, you win. Yeah, Pretty and Justin, Justin wrote this up on, on the site, and I, yeah. I, I kind of snagged his his quote here, so the credit for this one goes out to, uh, to Justin Kennedy in chat there, uh, who does a bunch of great write-ups on Wildstar TV. If you're a follower of Wildstar and you're not reading them, then you're doing the Internet's wrong. But... Um, he, he wrote this up, and I think he just summed it up really nicely. So for, forgive me, I'm going to read this to you. Go ahead. A little quote here. Because I, I think it's important that there's multiple strategies here. It's not <laughs> just go blow the other team up and win or go capture the flag and win. There's multiple ways to do this. So in order to come out on top in war plots, you can either win through energy attrition or generator destruction. The act of destroying the two enemy generators pretty straightforward. We all get that. Even though it's located behind random turns and traps at every corner of the war plot, if you get to the generators first and you destroy them both, you win. We're all familiar with that. Where things get shaken up a little bit is, on the other hand, perhaps your offensive power isn't that great, but your defense is pretty top-notch. You can still win in a war plot here through energy attrition. The idea is your war plot has a set amount of energy at the start of the fight, Depending on which nodes you've placed, it'll consume the energy every few seconds during the course of the battle. And if the enemy runs out of energy before you do, you win. Nanopacks will also give you the ability to upgrade your plugs beyond their basic levels, fire huge weapons, repair plugs that have been destroyed. So it's really important strategy to control your points so you can become stronger while the enemy becomes weaker. I think a great write-up, Justin. Uh, really breaks it down nicely, but... This actually makes me intrigued about a PvP match that I don't necessarily, and I think that's that's a big concern. Not a lot of people talk about it on shows and stuff like that, but I'm bad at PvP, uh, you know. But the idea of I don't have to be that mega kill all character. There's other ways for me to contribute besides going out there and being a body farm for somebody's kill count. Uh, that 
this actually makes PvP appealing to me. There's multiple things that players can bring to the team, not just who's doing the fastest DPS and who's going to kill the most people. So, so the, the thing with the energy attrition specifically is that, okay, so every you have a set amount of energy when you start your war plot. And then uh, just baseline, even if you didn't have any plugs, I don't know why you would go in with no plugs, but let's say you didn't go in with any plugs, you <laughs> still have some energy just getting consumed every tick. I think every tick is like five seconds or whatever. And uh, then player deaths would also contribute to that. So every time you respawn, you also use up a little bit of energy. And then each plug would actually use up a little bit of energy on its own. Now, adding in a plug actually increases your starting energy total as well. So it's not like it's just like a bad idea to have plugs. Obviously, the, it, it helps even though it does consume more energy. It still you know adds to your total energy as well. But ki having a plug get killed is like huge in terms of the amount of energy that you lose because just having a plug get destroyed is is sort of catastrophic in terms of the amount of energy at least compared to players now i i don't, I don't want to honey you know co coat this or whatever and make it just sound like amazing your, because your camera is wigging out <laughs> because you, you got lots of hand motions right in front of oh, it and okay. your camera's like i don't know what to do here <laughs> there you go All right. stay perfectly Sorry. still all right don't move. Don't, Got it. don't smile. Don't put your eyebrows up. Nothing. Go ahead. All right. So <laughs> I can't do it. I can't do it. I got two words in. All right. Okay. So I, I do want to say that there are real concerns about the current state of war plots. Two things, two really, really big things, really. First big thing is that uh, optimization is like really, really, really in need of looking at in terms of war plots right now just because uh it's sort of a slideshow for for most people who have uh tried to go in and, and, and do it obviously i think that, that this is not like a undoable kind of thing because it does seem to me to be like it's client side optimization that's necessary like in terms of like particle effects because uh i did hear from a couple of people who said that they turned all their settings all the way down and they were really really careful about which way they looked and, and, they, and they were able to still have 20 frames per second which is not great by any means but it's it's semi playable if i turned my monitor like, off it worked really well like it, yes. it ran just fine if i, I could my hear monitor. the sounds and just play everything now there is so, one big concern here for me though and that is that this could potentially if not balanced right turn into these long stalemated battles yeah where neither yeah, that, that war is the plot other thing is actually that, progresses I, I, but the, that second thing is actually a very much a numbers thing so so there's some like war plots honestly probably should have gotten into beta a little bit earlier and started getting iterated on a little bit earlier because the numbers just seem really off killing a generator is probably not that viable because they have so much health <laughs> it's so hard to kill them that it's it, you're almost just gonna go to energy attrition almost every time just because they're so hard to kill secondly it's just like if you compare the numbers like okay so like it's like hundreds of thousands of energy like for your total and a death is like like I've eight or sixteen or it's some really tiny amount so de player death doesn't even feel significant in in the scheme of things it's all about just the energy rate of consumption so a lot of these numbers really really need like some significant balance passes before they actually will work <laughs> at all but I, I I mean maybe that's something that they can do but I'm a little bit worried because of the release date and because of the the, the, the beta change to the beta weekends for closed beta as well and like I'm, I'm i'm holding out hope that they can they can manage it that they can get it to a playable state but right now it's a little bit painful so mr farhan Siddiqui, thank you for joining me today so we had a lot to cover i'm sure we'll have even more next week as more info keeps coming out you can follow him at Unindel on the Twitters. That's at U-N-I-N-D-E-L. If you want to follow me on the Twitters, that's at MagicMan1, M-A-G-I-C-K-M-A-N-N-1. If you haven't done it yet and you are planning to pre-order The Wild Star, head on over to GameBreaker.tv's brand new layout on the homepage. You'll love it. Check it out. We've got the links for you to go and pre-order GameStop's $59.99 copy. We'll keep you posted on the $79.99 copy. 
nice way to support Game Breaker and support the deals that we're here uh, presenting. And you get to save some money, too. If you'd like to donate to help out Game Breaker, it's at gofundme.com forward slash Game Breaker. Until next time, gang, stay safe. We'll see you out on the servers.